Hi everybody and welcome to our webinar on open spaces and biodiversity at Northeast Cambridge. Thanks for turning up. We're really happy to have a, a great panel here today for you. I'm just going to do some quick introductions. My name's Hannah Loftus. I'm a Special Projects Officer, Officer with the Shared Planning Service and I lead on the communications and engagement side of, of things with the policy team here. So I've very much been looking after a lot of the consultation elements of, the, um, of, of this plan. Just a few bits about how today is going to work. We're going to do a really quick uh, presentation for you going over some of the detail in the area action plan around biodiversity and open spaces um, and then we're going to do look at the Q&A's that hopefully you'll start posting into the Q&A panel at the bottom here. Um, we've got some great uh, we've got some great um, um, panel members and they're going to introduce themselves in a minute but just a little bit of housekeeping obviously this is a recorded session so um, we are going to be not reading out people's names when they post their questions because that's obviously a GDPR issue and um, please obviously do try to keep keep the questions on topic as much as possible we have got some other webinars coming up and we'll post details of them towards the end um, so if there are other things that our panel here can't answer we'll either ask answer them in written answers which we'll put on our website or we'll also carry them through to other webinars that we have coming up. So I'm just going to go through my lovely colleagues here and introduce you all to them. Firstly Terry. Good evening everybody, uh, my name is Terry D'Souza, I'm a Principal Planning Policy Officer at the Greater Cambridge Share Planning Service uh, and I was one of the officers uh, has been involved in preparing the plan and all the evidence bases, based documents that sit behind it. Hi, well, I'm Matthew Patterson. I'm the project lead for the North, developing the Northeast Cambridge Area Action Plan uh, for the Shared Planning Service. Dan? Hi, um, I'm Dan Weaver. Um, I'm the uh, Ecology Officer for uh, Cambridge Shared Service. Um, I have to admit, I am sitting in for Guy Belcher at the moment. He's actually on holiday, and Guy's been involved in the, the sort of the preparation of the, of the plan. So I will do my best to, to cover for him and answer questions that come to us. Thank you, and Bruce. Good evening. Uh, my name is Bruce Waller. I'm a Principal Planning Policy Officer in the Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Service, and I've been involved with the um, developing the policies and the local plan and helping curate the evidence base. Good evening, everybody. Um, Greg McAdeechan, planning consultant at the Shared Planning Service. Um, similar to the others, really, been working on NEC, preparing evidence and writing uh, policies. My lovely colleague. Oh, there she is. Mm. Hello, my name is Jo Burnham, and um, I support the Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Service with. Um, consultation and engagement and I'm here to support with hosting the webinars. Thank you everybody. So we're just going to, as I said, just do a really quick overview of some of the aspects to do with um, biodiversity and open spaces. I'm just going to share my screen now so hopefully those will start to come up in front of you shortly. Um, just give me one second while I get this up properly because it's not totally instant. Oh, sorry, Joe. I think you need to unshare your screen. Thank you. Brilliant. There we are. Um, so, Terry, I'm going to hand this over to you. Firstly, obviously, we're doing it just do a little, um, little run through of NEC generally, um, and then on to the open spaces. Thank you, Hannah. Um, I'll just turn my camera off because I'm having some slight IT issues uh, with my internet speed. So hopefully you will all be able to hear me, if not see me, if you can't see me. Um, okay, so North East Cambridge, um, as you can see, in, it's the area shown in orange. Um, so it's all the land between uh, the railway line all the way across Milton Road. It includes Cambridge Science Park and Cambridge Regional College. Now it's a huge site, it's 180 hectares of brownfield land, um, which is larger than Cambridge city centre. And to give you a sense of scale, um, if you walk from one side of the site to the other, it's the equivalent of walking from the beehive centre to the backs. Um, so it really is a huge site uh, with lots of potential. It's got some really good transport accessibility at the moment, and this will improve significantly over the coming decades. So we've got the 
the railway line, the guided busway, um, the Chisholm trails being built at the moment, and also the proposals for things such as CAM as well. It's only a 15 minute cycle ride from the city centre, so it's got really good accessibility to, to a lot of the kind of, you know, uh, main services and facilities in town. Um, but there are a range of landowners within this area, um, from Trinity, who own the Science Park, uh, to St John's College, who own the Innovation Park. Um, and so the Area of Action Plan is really important to try and coordinate planning across this area um, over, the, over the plan period and beyond. The site is strategically important as well for, Cam for Greater Cambridge and the wider region, which includes the uh, Oxford to Cambridge Arc. Um, and one of, the, one of the real key things that's come out of um, speaking to communities over the last couple of years, uh, particularly at the last round of consultation, was that local communities must really benefit from development of this site. It, it really can't be about us and them. It, the development needs to spread its benefits, uh, address deprivation in the wider area as well. So what is an area action plan? So an area action plan is a planning framework. It has a number of policies within it that uh, any development that comes forward would need to comply with. Uh, it has the equivalent status to a local plan. So um, it has a number of evidence-based documents that underpin it. Uh, I think at the moment we're up to 53. Uh, and it also goes through um, uh, a, a process which is similar to a local plan. So we've got consultation at the moment. We will, um, we will take all the comments into consideration seek to finalise the plan and then we will consult again before we go, go to an independent examination where there will be a, an, open, an open inquiry with an uh, independent chair from the planning inspectorate. Um, as you can see by the diagram, it, oh, sorry, as you can see by the diagram, it sits just below the national planning policy framework and alongside the local plans. So the vision for North East Cambridge. So we had a vision from the last consultation uh, and we took those comments on, to, on board and we've tweaked it slightly. Um, so at the moment, the vision is we want North East Cambridge to be an inclusive, walkable, low carbon, new city district with a lively mix of homes, workspaces, services and social spaces, fully integrated with surrounding neighbourhoods. Uh, so we picked out some headline figures for you. Um, so as you can see there, you've got the size of the site, which I've already mentioned. There are three homes within the site, despite its size. There, there are three, um, three homes on the sewage treatment work site, um, which... Um, not many people know about. There are around 15,000 jobs on the site at the moment, and there are roughly um, sort of four and a half thousand unused car parking spaces on Cambridge Science Park, um, based on the traffic data that we've been uh, collecting over the last few years. Uh, but in the future, this is what, what, um, what the plan is seeking to achieve is 8,000 homes, which would be for 18,000 residents, and 40% is, is what we're aspiring for in terms of um, affordable housing. Um, we think that we can create 20,000 new jobs on top of the 15,000 that are already there. And that's not just jobs in terms of um, office space and R&D, that's also industry and retail as well. Um, and then also new public spaces as well, which is what we're coming on to today, um, where we've got uh, 10 new hectares of public parks and squares, as well as uh, three new primary schools, a new library, um, a number of improved walking and cycling connections as well. So green spaces. So um, in terms of what the plan sets out is that we've got a range of green spaces um, across the area action plan area. So the main one is what we call the linear park. Now that, that is the park that stretches from Nuffield Road. So if you can imagine where, um, thank you Hannah, uh, if you can imagine where um, the allotments are on Nuffield Road at the moment, they stretch right all the, all the way up through the site up to the A14 and then under into Milton Country Park. Um, so that's about a kilometre in length in total. Uh, it also goes east over the railway line and goes into an area which we call Chesterton Fen, which is an area of land. It's outside of the area action plan area, but um, a, a space that we think we can set aside for um, open space um, as well as biodiversity improvements as well. Uh, we also have uh, a number of neighbourhood green spaces. Now, they're not shown on this diagram because they fall within the, the grey areas. So um, there are the, the sort of smaller scale neighbourhood areas within that. And also uh, green streets. One of the key things that we're aiming for in the Area Action Plan is to really try and reduce um, the number of people that need to travel by car. As I said, we've already got really good transport um, facilities at the moment. Um, it's in a really good place in terms of jobs and, and other facilities that we're looking to provide on the site. Um, so it really opens up the opportunity to create streets for people, um, like proper streets where you know, there isn't on-street car parking, except for blue badge holders. 
uh, and access um, you know and and the street becomes less about the car and more about the people and the activities within it um, I've also talked to I already talked about Cheston Fen um, and how North East Cambridge will link to the River Cam it, we're, we're so lucky in the sense that this site is on the edge of Cambridge so it has really you know, geographically it's so close to Milton Country Park it's close to the river um, and the wider the wider fens um, so you know this is a real opportunity that not not just for people that are going to be living and working in North East Cambridge but those that live around the area at the moment to in, in, improve their accessibility um, to the wider countryside um, so you could be at Nuns Way Pavilion for example and be able to walk all the way through North East Cambridge under the A14 and you could be in Milton Country Park without even having to go along any sort of main roads um, or you could go over the railway line into Cheston Fen and along the river corridor. Um, again, you know, without having to walk down Milton Road or get into your car. Um, so this is just um, just sort of explain what I've talked about already slightly. So we uh, number one is that linear park, uh, and then we've got the area at number two, which is the, what we're calling Cowley Triangle. So that's opposite um, St John's Innovation Park. Uh, we then have the, the kind of what we're calling the Green High Street which is trying to integrate the first public drain, which runs through the site at the moment and is, I think it's fair to say, a slightly unloved um, feature of this part of, the, part of Cambridge, uh, and how we can really integrate that into, into, this, into this new high street for, for the district. Um, and actually it becomes a real key, a key feature, not only in terms of uh, public realm, but also in terms of biodiversity as well. We are then looking to, uh, we've obviously got the Science Park open spaces at, at the moment, which is number four, and how we can try and improve um, some of those open spaces as well on the edges of the site. So really trying to draw people into the Science Park and into North East Cambridge more generally. So you've got Cambridge Park Brook, which, um, which is just over there, and then you've got Science Park Place, which is where we're proposing to put a small local centre in at the Science Park. Um, and then the last one is um, Station Place, which would be um, a small green space um, connecting Cambridge North Station and the new district centre. Yeah. So in terms of scale and amount, um, there, like I said, there's a number of new parks which we're proposing. So if you took the Linear Park and Cowley Triangle, so just those two, not including the Science Park Brook and all the others, um, that gives you 10.6 hectares of major strategic open space. So to give you an example, it's slightly bigger than what Parker's piece is at the moment, if you combine those together. Uh, we've got about 8.8 .8 hectares of existing public space, so thinking about what's in the science park at the moment, for example. And then, think, and then those neighbourhood spaces, which aren't shown on our diagrams, which are just under 7 hectares of space in total. So altogether, these equate to around uh, about 25, 26 hectares of open space, which is the equivalent of Jesus Green and Midsummer Common combined. So we've got some really important principles for open space. So what we're trying to do is not just create large areas of lawn effectively, um, whilst those are really important and obviously people need space to kick a ball around, they, open spaces need to be multifunctional as well. So they're actually well used throughout the year by a whole range of people from the young to the old. Um, and just making sure that um, we create open spaces that are really climate resilient as well. So you're not creating football pitches that effectively you can't use for half the year because, because they're underwater or they're waterlogged. Um, and also making sure that our landscaping um, you know, really thinks about um, the effects of climate change and making sure that we create uh, open spaces that are sort of drought or climate change resilient. And also integrating uh, sustainable drainage systems as well. So these are some of our examples of open space just taken from elsewhere. So um, one of the documents you can read online is the is called our typology study and it's basically examples of developments from elsewhere. So we haven't just looked at buildings, we've also looked at open spaces as well. So um, starting from the top left, this is an example of a linear park. Um, as you can see, a whole range of different functions there from seating to play to water, water features, um, shading. It's actually hard to believe that that's actually sitting on top of a, um, a shopping centre. You wouldn't know it. But, you know, it gives you an example of how of how you can create, you know, really good quality um, open spaces um, in quite innovative ways. The centre top picture is an example of, you know, how you could maybe try and imagine what Cowley Road could look like in terms of the high street um, and how you could create a linear sort of um, central park along that along that high street. Uh, the top right picture gives you an example of those neighbourhood spaces. So that one's taken from Copenhagen. As you can see, the scale of the buildings, you're looking at sort of seven storeys um, buildings within this area. Um, but 
how that green space can be used to help you know help offset offset that provide provide those sort of doorstep uh, areas really uh, of open space which are so important to a whole range of people um, and then thinking about the more private open spaces so the bottom left picture is from Ocean Estate in Stepney in London. Uh, that's an example of an internal courtyard. So that is a space that's open to the residents that live within that block. Um, obviously, none of those um, none of those open spaces are shown on any of our diagrams in the plan. Um, but they, those those are the types of things that we would be expecting development to have uh, to to include as it comes forward. Uh, the bottom middle picture is an example of a podium garden. So that's actually above street level. Um, I think it's actually got a Sainsbury's um, underneath it. Um, and it just shows how you, again, you can create those kind of communal spaces for the residents um, in, in, a, in, a, in a quite a innovative way, really. And then the top one is, is taken from the States, where it shows how you can use the roof spaces as well. Um, you now, obviously, they might not be appropriate for all uses, but, you know, things like food growing, which was a really, uh, a really good discussion that we had at the last uh, Q&A webinar. Um, so it just sort of shows examples of open space. And then... It gets us to think about streets as well. As I said, you know, people won't be parking outside their outside their front doors, um, and so it, it really allows us to reimagine what the street could be like. So you know, imagine imagine your street with no cars on it. You know, what could you do with that space be between the buildings? There's so much we can do. This just gives you a flavour. I'm not saying that this is all going to happen at Northeast Cambridge, but it just gives you a flavour of actually there are so much there is so much possibilities of what we can do um, in. The, um, between buildings in these spaces. So whilst we're thinking about, you know, open space, I don't think we should forget that streets are part of that um, and that they play an important role in people's well-being and their amenity as well. And then biodiversity. So the plan seeks to achieve a 10% biodiversity net gain, which is what the government is requiring um, new development um, to do as part of the forthcoming environment bill. Um, and so that's really about embedding biodiversity in design of all buildings and streets um, from the very, very beginning and improvements in size, quality, diversity, as well as the relationship of the site's habitats as well with each other's and those around it. And we're seeking to protect and enhance as much of the biodiversity in the site as possible. Um, and that includes things like the Cowley Road Hedgerow, which mo most people don't know about, um, but is a, you know, a real possible contender as a city wildlife site. Um, and securing appropriate mitigation um, and habitat management and monitoring through legal agreements as well. So we're just going to go through a few of the questions that people have been asking on social media and so forth um, recently about open spaces and biodiversity before we come on to all of your Q&As. Which I can't remember who's taking this first question actually. What open spaces will the public be able to access? It's obviously a really important one that Terry has touched on. I think it's me actually. Thanks, Hannah. Uh, yeah, so Terry's run through pretty much uh, the sort of strategic open spaces that will be available. So the linear park, the triangle site around Cowley Road, the civic spaces around the um, uh, the station and also in the district centre that we're proposing as well as um, the green spaces that are already in the science park. So those are big strategic open spaces that are available to the public. But at, a, at the next level down, if you like, there will be a raft of sort of neighborhood parks, pocket parks, those sorts of things, playgrounds for children, play spaces for teenagers and other um, multi-games areas, things like that, which will sit at that next layer down that will all be publicly available as well before you get down to sort of the site level where you expect to have private amenity space and, and gardens like that. But even within that, it may be that some of those open spaces, the private ones could be open during the day for most people to um, walk through, to connect up to different places. And it may be that they're just closed at night for security purposes. Another question that um, actually we were doing an in-person consultation earlier today in, in um, Nons Way, and some people were asking about this as well, how do things connect outside of the area or action plan? area. Who's taking this one? Is this a... uh, uh, well, do you want to do it first or do you, do you want to say? Oh, you do it, Greg. You do it, Greg. Well, I, I mean, I, I think Terry's touched on this already. Um, we, we, there's going to be a, a green infrastructure strategy um, that at a strategic level that's going to be um, uh, developed, which this site will link into. 
So as, as part of as part of that, um, the site's already going to be as Terry's already alluded to. It's going to link to um, Milton Country Park. Um, we're going to uh, and, and obviously Chesterton Fen as well, uh, and then the, the the wider river river corridor um, and the Chisholm Trail uh, going 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 further further up. So the, the, there's already identified um, connections in, in place. We're already, we're looking at other potential um, connections, um, sort of Histon sort of side uh, um, uh, of of the site as well. Um, and uh, you know, uh, and, and then obviously connecting um, the, the site into to existing uh, you know existing areas um, that that uh, they're in the in the, the wards to the south. So uh, places like Nun, Nuns Way and Bramble Fields and and and, 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 the, and the like. So um, yeah, the 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 open spaces, the strategic open spaces anyway, are going to form a, a strategic function within um, NEC area as well as a, as, a, as a wider as a wider network. Um, you know, through through the green infrastructure strategy. And lastly, about the habitats in and around North East Cambridge, we've touched on Cowley Road Hedgerow, but I know there's obviously been an awful lot of work looking at wider habitats. Um, yeah, so we were very lucky that um, MK Ecology have produced a, a biodiversity assessment of the entire area, uh, which they published in February of this year. So they've actually gone through everywhere and had a look to see what we've got. And I think the answer is a surprisingly more than you would think in an area that's actually as built up as it is. Um, so there are areas of woodland, the largest being sort of between the water treatment plant and the A14 in the northeast of the site. Um, there are also areas of grassland, so quite a lot of it is amenity grassland, but other areas of more sort of species rich, what we would call semi-improved grassland. Um, we also have places like brood or vegetation, so things like brambles and nettles and things like that, where you get lots of different butterflies and stuff working. Um, there's also areas of, of ponds, and I think probably the more important one one of the more important ones is the public first drain. So that is a wet drain that has been running, you know, through that area for a very long time. It's got a lot of associated species to it, especially things like water bowl that are in the area. So again, it's very important for biodiversity. Um, the, the hedgerows that have been mentioned are actually really important because they've been around for a long time. They are, from what I understand, they're remnants of the original uh, field system hedgerows that were left in place as, as Cambridge sort of was expanded and built up around them. So they are very important. Um, and then even things like the, the buildings themselves can become habitats. We have lots of birds and bats that will live inside of those buildings. So there is actually sort of more habitats than you would think would be there, you know, on first glance. Um, around the outside, we've got probably my most important area would be things like the River Cam, which runs quite close by. Uh, the River Cam itself is a protected area. It's a local uh, a county wildlife site. And obviously Chesterton Fen, which is, is next door, which hopefully we'll be able to use as, a, as a, almost like a receptor site to help really boost uh, biodiversity in the area. Thanks, Dan. That was brilliant. Hannah, sorry, I was also going to add um, the uh, area um, that's going to form part of the bund um, uh, that uh, for the, the 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 A14 noise barrier. Uh, we're looking at possibilities of um, how that could be multifunctional as well as not not just um, uh, for noise attenuation, uh, but also for habitat creation, for um, green infrastructure, wildlife corridor um, link uh, links as well. So I'll just mention that. Fantastic. Thanks. I'm just going to stop my share now uh, and I can see some questions connecting in here. Um, so first question, areas connecting to did not mention the mere way. That's true, actually, and that is a really important connection that we're going to um, be, be using for North East Cambridge. I wonder if anyone wants to maybe um, would um, Terry like to talk to that, because I know there's been a lot of discussion around that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, so Mere Way is a really important uh, route going north, uh, particularly uh, with the cycle improvements that are beginning to be coming through there um, as part of the water beach um, development. Um, so yeah, so it, that will also act as a really important route for people to access the wider countryside. Um, so yeah, no, absolutely. So apologies, I didn't mention it in the presentation, but yeah, that is that is part of the plan as well. And I think one of the other things with the connectivity is that um, it's not just the sort of, if you like, the green network connectivity, there is also the street level connectivity and things like the guided busway that are at the moment are a real barrier to movement. There are many, many new crossings that are looking at, uh, that we're looking at producing as part of the area action plan. So there'll just be a lot of different ways that people can filter through the site and then up to things like Mirway and the other cycle routes around the area. 
Um, next question I can see coming up here. What interaction, if any, would you envisage with the adjoining allotment site? I wonder if maybe Bruce might want to talk to this. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I don't think we've necessarily looked in sort of detail of how actual individual sites might interact, but I think we would look to make sure that the current site, any sort of the, the, the new development integrates with local communities. So I think where there's opportunities to work with what already exists on the periphery, uh, we'll take full advantage of. Um, but clearly um, that will be nearer the time when perhaps more detailed proposals are put forward. Um, but clearly this, the intention is to integrate the, north, the new development North East Cambridge with the existing communities all around and um, working with allotment holders perhaps and who manage them will be an opportunity to do that. Um, Does anybody else want to in? Yeah, you go, Greg. I was just going to quickly say there's going to be um, there's going to be some legibility with um, the, the, the AAP work as well. So uh, where where you know we're, we're not necessarily potentially creating physical connection, new physical connections to, for example, the, the allotments. There will certainly be um, uh, you know whole scale legibility signage uh, improvements throughout the site throughout the whole site. So you, you can understand and, and understand the scale as well and. The, um, of, of where where facilities like the allotments are from from various um, um, places in the, um, the site. Yeah, and I was just going to add that we obviously included the allotment site when we went out to issues and options consultation in terms of the boundary of the AAP area, but we recognised that actually um, all we were seeking to do through the AAP was to protect that. So it was actually better to take it out. We don't want that site developed at all. We want to maintained and protected as allotments. It's really important to that local community um, and it will be important to, to new residents as well within North East Camp. Thanks Matt. I, I was wondering if um, one thing we actually didn't touch on too much was um, we touched on the connectivity to Milton Country Park but we didn't touch on the, some of the discussions with Milton Country Park and I know that has been raised by some people as well in terms of the capacity of Milton Country Park. I wonder if we might be able to just clarify a bit on that for the audience here today. Um, maybe I'll give that one to, to Matt as well. Yeah that's fine I'll deal with this one. Um, yeah so we have we've been engaging with uh, the Milton Country Park for a long time on the AAP. Obviously we are all sensitive to the existing pressures that that park's under terms of meeting needs um, and demands at time. Um, and we've talked obviously with the surrounding local communities and who utilize that park significantly. And that's one of their concerns too, but they also see the benefits of having uh, better access, more sustainable access to that park uh, to be able to access it uh, more frequently as well. And not just by driving, but walking and cycling will be a huge benefit. And then we're talking to the park mainly about how we, uh, we're obviously seeking to provide sufficient uh, open space on site, but it is a regional park and therefore is available to all residents within the Greater Cambridge area to come and utilise that area. So we're talking to them about how we could potentially look at ways and means of increasing capacity within that um, through the facilities provided through um, different management regimes as well for the park to enable that to take place. Um, but I think, again, it's, it's open at the moment to look at and work with them to determine and the wider community to determine what is the best outcome for the regional park and ensure it is maximised in terms of its use, but we also protect it in terms of its, um, its value as a, as a wildlife site and here uh, in open space. Thanks. Um, and I hope everyone knows how to do that, but I've just had a, a question about um, how can uh, people feed in their ideas for creative uses of open space? Well, this is a really good question because, of course, this is what we're doing at the moment with the consultation itself. We really want to hear as many views as possible on what we should be including. These are draft policies and these are draft ideas at this stage. So they're very much things that we're going to be evaluating in light of the comments that we receive. You can comment online. So we have an online comment system at greatercambridgeplanning.org slash NEC. 
and you can go there and have a look. Um, and you can also email us and we'll be posting the details of the email address and so forth at the end of this. So we really do want as many comments from members of the public as possible because it's so important that that comes into us and that we can make sure that we're meeting your needs uh, as well as everything else. Yeah, and just to add to that, I mean, we are looking at really innovative approaches for NEC. Um, Perry took us through some of the examples of things we're looking at that, that other schemes have provided. Um, and we are looking for ideas from anyone and, and we're very open to those ideas. We're still at draft plan stage, so it's um, people's chance to influence the, the plan significantly. And um, certainly we understand even with COVID-19 that how we utilize and how we appreciate and value open spaces is, is really key and we have to look at innovative ways of how a, how we provide it but also how we utilize it and make efficient use of that uh, asset and resource for the city. Can I just add that um, we're really keen to also up the health and well-being agenda for NEC so again we feel like the open spaces are a key opportunity to help encourage people to lead healthier lifestyles and it's basically, and it's not just like a seasonal option where open spaces, which are perhaps only encourage their use during the good, the better weather, but we, we want really open spaces to be those which can be used all year round. So for example, the, the tracks don't, aren't susceptible to being muddy when there's been heavy rains. Um, so we are keen to get people's ideas on how we can encourage people to lead healthier lifestyles open spaces which encourage people to use them. Um, people leave, lead very sort of, um, uh, how should I say, people's nine to five routine is often not, 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 not kind of something we do these days. People work odd hours, want to do open space or activities first thing in the morning, late at night. So it's basically ideas on how we can have the open spaces sort of meeting the needs of people who um, can basically lead a healthier lifestyle throughout the year. Thanks. One other thing that has been asked recently has been about the 10% biodiversity net gain and can we or should we be doing more than that? I know that's a really tricky one, Dan, but I'm wondering if you can just speak to that just briefly. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the 10% the net gain is, is a bare minimum. So, I mean, it's absolutely possible for, to go beyond that. If we take a look at some of the city deal projects, some of the transport hubs that are being looked at at the moment proposed, what they are saying is they will have a minimum 10%, but they're actually targeting 20% net gain. Now, this is what we would call measurable net gain. So this is net gain in terms of provision of habitats. Now, there are other types of, of ecological and biodiversity um, enhancements that we can actually include that would not be included within that 10% or 20% whatever um, category. So things like having um, habitat boxes, having roosting boxes, having uh, nesting boxes, having um, log piles or hedgehog holes in, 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 in fences or things like that will all add to the biodiversity area or they may not necessarily be uh, measured in the same way. So I think the 10% is the bare minimum but we can always aim to go higher than that if we have the capacity to do so. That's brilliant. Just, I mean for those of us, because it always sounds a bit like how on earth does one measure biodiversity, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about how that actually does get measured when you talk about Again. Um, absolutely sure. Um, so it, it is a little bit complicated. I, I, I'll try not to be too specific. So we have what we would call uh, matrices or calculations that we can undertake and it gives a value to certain um, habitats. So those habitats are valued on their diversity, on their contribution to uh, species uh, and so on. So for example, an amenity grassland, so just a grassland, a field, the grass net has a lower value than a, a, a wildflower meadow. So they are measured differently. So what we can actually do is we can allocate, allocate, <laughs> allocate numbers to them and create a value of habitats for the entire area. So for example, we would say uh, this area is worth 50, 50 units of biodiversity. So when we then put our overlay our development on top of that land and we see what is being removed and what is being taken, we can see, well, actually, we're going to lose 30 units of those 50 units of biodiversity. And therefore, we need to make sure that we're not just losing that 30%. We're going to recreate that 30% somewhere, those, uh, sorry, 30 units somewhere else. But we're actually also going to add 30, another three units. So we're going to create 33 units of new habitat. So it, it is quite complicated. Uh, DEFRA have been going through uh, uh, several iterations of these calculations. The latest calculation is in beta mode. It's called the DEFRA metric 2.0. It's very cool. If you're, if you're a bit of a nerd like me, then you'll really love it. 
Um, there are other matrices available as well, just in case. So uh, Warwickshire County Council have their own matrix. And also there's an organization called the Environment Bank, which uses another matrix as well. So they are they're very similar, but they have slightly different underlying assumptions, but all are valid in certain ways. Thank you. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, that was a really good answer. Thank you very much. Um, another question that has been asked recently is a very simple one. Will there be space to kick a ball about? Um, Terry, I wonder if you, you might answer that one. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like I said, so um, some of these strategic open spaces that we're proposing, um, you know, they are they are large. And when you when you sort of combine all of those spaces together, then, you know, like I said, there's 25, 26 hectares of open space in total um, that we're proposing just at that sort of higher level and not including those sort of neighbourhood spaces. So absolutely. Um, plus, like I was saying, you know, we need to sort of rethink the street as well and think of how, you know, how, how people use those spaces. You know, I remember being a child it was, you know, quite normal to kick a ball about in the street. But, you know, these days you can't because, you know, you've got so much on street car parking and, you know, and all that kind of thing. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, there's, and obviously, obviously, you know, all of the schools will come with um, their own uh, play facilities as well. Um, and, you know, it's really standard practice these days to make sure that schools have community use agreements tied into them. So, you know, when the schools aren't using their fields and they're, you know, their play facilities that they're open to the public. Um, so, yeah, so that's something else that we'd be, you know, looking to do. But no, yeah, and just, just to add to that, I mean, we are, like I said, we're looking at innovative ways. So instead of providing, you know, uh, for say four soccer pitches, grass soccer pitches, we might look at uh, putting in uh, 3G pitches, which um, you can, uh, you can use more often, don't require the same amount of maintenance, um, can put flood lighting on, um, can split up as well. So uh, it, it just ensures that actually uh, you can utilize a, a smaller amount of space and get twice as much use out of it for the local community. So it's that kind of innovation that we're looking at. Thanks, Matt. That's really interesting. Just in terms of Chesterton, Ben, we've sort of talked about this area quite a bit in terms of access. What do we think it's actually going to be useful? Because I know that we've also talked about it in terms of flood resilience and, and, and water storage as well. And I know that's something that people are quite interested in. Yeah, I can take that one. Um, yeah, so Chesterton, Ben, it, obviously it's, it's, um, it's by the river, it's within the floodplain. Um, so it's really important that, you know, we aren't, putting football pitches and, and such like on that area um, because that wouldn't really be appropriate. So what we're saying is that you can create um, informal amenity space on that area. So, you know, the sort of place where, you know, people can go and walk their dog and, you know, um, sort of have a picnic, that kind of thing. Um, but it's also uh, a place where we think that we can create some real bio biodiversity improvements as well. Um, really trying to draw in the river, the river corridor um, and it really being that kind of link between the river and the site. Uh, North East Cambridge uh, and so you know there's real real chance for biodiversity improvement in that area um, so yeah so there's a bit of a mixture really uh, the ecologists are saying that you know because of the, the flooding issues um, that there are in, in parts of that area you know you could you could really create like almost like a wetland in places with you know sort of wetland habitats and that kind of thing so there is so much scope um, to do to do some real real good um, amenity and biodiversity in, in improvements in that area. That, that does lead on to this wider question that has been asked quite a bit about the, the thing that's technically known as SUDS, so sustainable drainage systems, and how that counts with the open space areas that we are giving in the plans. Terry, I know that you've sort of been quite good on this in, in the past. Maybe you want to just explain how that works. Sorry, Hannah, could you repeat that? Sorry, just about the, the sustainable drainage systems, because there's always been this question about do those areas actually count as public, public open space or not? Because we want a lot of sustainable drainage systems areas within mm. our NEC, don't we? We do, yeah. So the, the, the sustainable urban drainage systems or SUDs, um, they don't count as your open space because essentially they're, you know, they're waterways and ill, you know, they, they're used for water storage. Um, so they don't count, but the, the, it's really important that they are part of that landscaping. Um, so they're fully integrated within those open spaces. So it's not just a case of creating channels under the ground and storage tanks under the ground. Actually, they become a feature. So they link into the first public drain. You know, you could have swales, you could have attenuation ponds, that kind of thing. So, you know, there's real scope to make sure that, you know, these drainage systems are part of the landscape, but not part of the open space numbers. 
Um, so yeah, so there's a lot, there's a lot of scope there to, to bring that together. And, and what the plan is seeking to do is trying to make sure that there's a coordinated approach to SUDS as well. So it's not just that piecemeal bit, you know, where one developer does one thing and one developer does another thing. Um, you know, we're just trying to make sure that, you know, we have a SUDS network for, for North East Cambridge overall as well, which is really important. And, and also biodiversity net gain, a standard from the uh, natural. <laughs> I just had a question in about more about the sports provision. Kicking a ball about is fine on informal space, but many sports need formal space that cannot go on a 3G pitch like tennis, croquet, cricket and hockey. Um, I think, Matt, maybe you can answer that because you were talking about the 3B, 3G pitch question. Yeah, I think the 3G was just the, the kick a ball around one. But certainly you'll have tennis courts within the areas. In particular, we're looking at even... Um, innovation for tennis courts having them on top of say you could have them on top of a car park and things like that so innovative ways of providing them but you'll have traditional tennis courts and the like uh, in terms of bigger um, spaces for like cricket and, and even hockey facilities and things like that we're doing the open spaces strategy as part of the local plan um, and we need to understand what's required for NEC, but what's required for North East Cambridge more generally. So we're looking at, um, obviously, if you're going to provide a hockey pitch, is it better here or is it better somewhere else that meets a wider need of, of a much wider community? Um, so we're looking at where, where the right locations are for those things that either will be provided for within NEC or NEC development will contribute towards provision somewhere else. And we're also protecting some of the existing spaces, aren't we, at Cambridge Regional College and so forth, some of their facilities? Yeah, definitely. So they've got multi-use games areas out the back and things like that. And certainly um, there's uh, scope within the science park as well um, to provide further community facilities that are, would be available for um, uh, leisure needs of the workers during the day and potentially residents and others during the the, the evening and that would serve both um, new houses on the other side of Milton Road but also uh, with the connections and links that we're looking to make with Kings Hedges and Milton and others would bring uh, actually community onto the science park to make use of those facilities as well. Um, there's a, a question about trees which is a really interesting one about what consideration we've been giving to planting trees throughout the site. Um, I know that the Cambridge tree strategy is, is really the one that we are adopting in terms of the standards and approach to canopy cover and increasing tree coverage across the area for climate reasons as well as other things. But maybe, I don't know if that's something that Bruce or Greg maybe would speak to, or, or Dan maybe. Who would say that? Why don't Dan talk to that? I think you know about trees, Dan. Um, I, 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 I luckily, I, I have been sitting next to the tree officer for some time in the office, <laughs> yes. in the office so a little bit. Um, I think it's 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 along the lines of getting the right trees in the right places and making sure that they are going to survive where they are. So it, it's it's you do quite often come across some developments that, pro, that plant inappropriate trees in inappropriate places. So I think given the space that we have, especially in the open spaces and in those large green streets, being able to plant larger trees in those areas, you know, will be really really beneficial. Obviously, they can help with things like pollution and micro taking micros out of the air. They can help with urban cooling. They can help with shading as well. So I think. The more we can sort of introduce trees into the into the area, the the, the, the healthier it's going to be for everybody. Thanks very much. Look, um, there's a some some people have been asking um, online about whether open spaces will be well let in safe use at night. Um, and there's obviously always a crossover here, isn't there, between sort of wildlife and, and dark skies issues and making sure that they are safe and, and well used in terms of being good routes. Matt, maybe you would speak to that? Yeah, yeah, happy to. Um, yeah, I mean, primarily we're looking at a network of uh, green spaces that provide your um, connections, really, your walking and strategic cycling connections to get to your places. So um, they all need to be available uh, throughout the day and the evening and, and into the night, and they need to be well lit and overlooked uh, and well managed. And so certainly on those areas, yes. Um, Beyond those, you'll have private amenity spaces as well, where obviously, again, you, you know, you you expect to have uh, a level of security on those two, and a level of overlooking and and. Uh, but certainly, where we have areas of biodiversity, we we would hope that those are um, 
milk lit, if you like, the dark areas for the bats and the others, um, and they're just natural habitats. And, and during the day, they'll provide fantastic amenity, and during the evening, obviously screening and things like that from, from other light pollution. Um, but, you know, you'll get a combination. But for the vast majority of areas that are the main thoroughfares, that are the key cycle and walking connections, they uh, should be very safe and secure and everyone should feel, uh, and hopefully very active and live as well in terms of what we're providing within the area. And, um, you know, you should have kids playing in the streets and people walking around. So it should be, should be, um, should feel very safe for all of those in the community. Thanks. I was wondering, um, sometimes management of open spaces is something that comes up as a real issue on developments like this. You know, who's actually going to run them in the long term and what those agreements might look like. And we see this is really early days and this is a 20 year plan. So we definitely know that we're going to have a lot of work to do on this. But have there been any initial discussions about some of that stuff across with the landowners and so forth? Yeah, we have. We've been in discussions, obviously. Um, uh, ideally, uh, in, I mean, as, as we've said, it's, it's going to take a long time to build out NEC and it'll be very much a phase development across different land parcels. And therefore the responsibility will fall to the developers in the first instance or the landowners to manage that, those open spaces, get them uh, well established, um, really well utilized, get all the facilities in. And, and then we're looking at obviously them uh, contributing towards the long-term maintenance of those parks. If, uh, as Dan says, we need the right species in the right places in terms of the trees to make sure that actually the, the levels of maintenance aren't huge in terms of being uh, drought resistant and all the other things. So, but we'll, they still will need ongoing management and maintenance to ensure they're, they're uh, fit for purpose. Um, and so we're looking at how the developments within there and the users may contribute towards that. And it may be that once the development's complete, uh, the councils will look at either taking that over or it could be that a management company, uh, a body corporation of the whole area takes, takes on that because it may be associated with things like the management of the sustainable drainage system as well, how that's upkept, because we need to keep that up to date as well in terms of its management to ensure that it does what it's meant to do. Um, obviously, we're looking at um, doing transport hubs around the area, so they need management ongoing as well about how you uh, ensure that different sites uh, contribute towards those and people have good access to those facilities and so there's a raft of management across the piece and it may be that it might not just seem to fall to the councils to do but it could be under a body court and it could be actually community managed so you know a residents association led kind of body um, that, that, that take, take the lead on that. But yes as you say it's early doors and we're still open for, for ideas and innovation and we're looking at what other people are doing as well. So following on from that, there's a very good question that's come in that says these ideas seem excellent. Well done Matt, your ideas seem excellent, but cynics might ask how confident you are that developers will take them fully on board. Some think planning authorities have no teeth. Yeah, yeah Matt, and often, teeth. It, often <laughs> it can be the case, but um, we're, we're kind of in a really lucky position in North East Cambridge and that the vast majority of landowners aren't in it just to do a development and then leave. Uh, you've got the likes of the council and Trinity and um, Crown uh, and uh, the Science Park in St John's all have a vested interest, a long long term vested interest in these sites and in the area as a whole um, and therefore they want and need to see uh, ongoing management uh, to um, realise the, for their own selfish means, I mean the, the strategic financial benefits at the end of the day of leasing properties and, and um, getting new tenants into some of these science buildings and other things and making the area nice so that workers want to come and work here and people want to live here. So I think um, we're very confident and that we also understand it's going to take a long time to build out. So we have the ability to um, continue to work with them. And if things aren't working initially, we have time and to fix those problems with them as well. And um, 
find solutions to issues. I suppose more bro broadly, this is really why we're doing the area action plan in the first place, isn't it? Because we do need these specific policies so we can hold developers to a vision. Without a coordinated policy, it might be that we wouldn't have enough teeth, as it were, to, to, to control that development. Would, would you say that was the case, Matt? Yeah, yeah, sure. I was taking it more from the, the management and maintenance side of the open spaces. But yeah, no, certainly the, the overarching purpose of why we're doing an AAP is to set out what the council and community's expectations are for development here. And um, certainly uh, we, again, that long build out process enables us to ensure that actually we get significant compliance because if they don't comply the first time around we're unlikely to give them planning permission again for the next part of their phase development so they need to work with us and the communities as much as we need to work with them to get a um, uh, development that we're all content with and satisfied that delivers on the vision that we want for the area and the objectives that we've set out in the AAP. One thing I would say just from a consultation perspective is that if you do think some of these ideas seem excellent, please tell us that in the consultation because the more we hear from you support for some of these ideas, the more evidence we have to put into the area action plan going forward and to put to those developers to say these ideas really are well supported by the community. So whilst we also want to hear criticism and we want to hear what we could do better, we do want to hear where we've got it right because that really strengthens our hand when we're speaking to developers and landowners in the area to say, you know, these aren't just ideas that we're sort of coming up with in the e these are actually ideas that people out there in the community really care about. So please, please, a little bit of a plug for our consultation, but please, please do write to us online or in paper form and tell us which of the ideas you think are excellent, as well as the ones that you could do better on. I think Joe's actually just going to, on that point, um, start to share some of the details of that consultation so you can have a look. So firstly, we've got a few more webinars coming up in September. Um, we've got about just over five, about five and a half weeks to go yet in the consultation. So there's still plenty of time to kind of read the documents and, and hear more about it. We've got four more webinars coming up on different aspects of North East Cambridge Area Action Plan. And you can see the website address at the bottom there where you can find those details. Um, and then these other details for the website, the email address and all the other details for you to be able to get in touch with us. And if you want any paper copies of things as well, please just drop us a line or give us a ring and we'll get them through to you. I've got a, uh, a, a question that's actually just come up on the back of your management um, points, Matt, around uh, well, with, if, if I suppose I should say a little tongue in cheek with the coming unitary, well, it's obviously not a unitary mm -hmm. on the table yet, but there no. are, um, so we don't know that. Mm. Would a parish council for the area be the right place to focus the management? I think it's a really interesting question about, we have a community forum that has been informing development in the area and that comprises representatives from the residents associations in the area and so forth. And we are actually talking about what the legacy for that community forum might be going forward. As Matt says, does it have a role in management and maintenance of the spaces? How do they get involved? Um, and we will we will see um, where that comes in. I don't know if Matt, you want to add anything more to, to some of those sort of structural questions. Yeah, I think initially, um, I don't know that a parish council would be the right approach, mainly because it, it, it will be a long time before we get to a state where actually um, we want to take it out of the developer's um, hands, if you like. And in that context, I think it would be useful more so to have sort of, um, the new community coming into the area to influence how they wish the area to be managed and maintained and having that dialogue with the developers up front and and with the surrounding communities as well, Killings Hedges, which are well established and have good networks in terms of their residents associations and others being involved in a, a sort of um, a, a committee sort of process really that that has oversight over the management arrangements and works with the councils and with the developers to uh, get it all right really and and see how far we can get so um we will need to wait and see there's a comment that um orchard park shows that a parish council could be a good approach yeah 
Yeah, well, we're, we're taking the lessons learned from all of the schemes around. So we are learning from the, what, what are the issues at Orchard Park and uh, that tends to be around parking mainly and things like that and, and but certainly management of some of the spaces. So we need to look and at, at it holistically as well and just see what, what is the best approach, whether that's a council led, community led or whether it's, it's parish. So I think it's, it's certainly going to be one that, you know, again, we would welcome your views on through the consultation because it is a long term scheme and we do need to try and work with the community to find something that works for everybody in the area and not just what we think will be best. So please, please do respond to us on the consultation um, and do check out our website as well, where there are a lot more FAQs and some videos and so forth as well. So thanks very much to everybody. Um, I hope that's been interesting um, and you've got some of the answers to some, some of the things that you're interested in. We will, um, we will obviously be reading up on all of the responses we get through the consultation. Please respond between now and the 5th of October. That is the deadline for responses. We've got to get on with the plan and we've got to feedback on that to, to yourselves as a community and also to the elected members and so forth. And we really, really value everything that comes in. So thank you very much. Thank you also to all, all the panel members. Um, and we'll be putting this up on our YouTube channel. So if you have been watching and you think any of your friends or neighbours or communities may be interested in watching it back, you can check it out on our YouTube channel along with lots of other great content. I do feel a little bit like a TV presenter, but there you go. Um, well, thank well you very much. <laughs> and, and we'll see you at the next one soon.